Hello, and welcome to theCUBE's special showcase with Unstoppable Domains. I'm John Furrier, your, your host of theCUBE here in Palo Alto, California. We have Matt Gould, who's the founder and CEO of Unstoppable Domains. Matt, great to come on. Congratulations on the success of your company, Unstoppable Domains. Thanks for kicking off this showcase. Well, thank you, happy to be here. So I love, first of all, love the story you got going on here. Love the approach, very innovative, but you're also on the big web three wave, which we know where that leads into metaverse, unlimited new ways people are consuming information, content applications are being built differently. This is a major wave and it's happening. Some people are trying to squint through the hype versus reality, but you don't have to be a rocket science to realize that it's a cultural shift and a technical shift going on with Web3. So this is kind of the, what's happening in the market. So give us your take, what's your reaction? You're in the middle of it, you're on this wave. Yeah, well, I would say it's a torrent of change uh, that got unleashed just over a decade ago with Bitcoin coming out and giving people the ability to have uh, digital items that they could actually own themselves online. And this is a new thing and people coming, especially from my generation of millennials, they spend their time online in these digital spaces and they've wanted to be able to own these items. And you see it from you know, gaming and Fortnite and skins and Warcraft and all these other places. But this is really uh, being enabled by this new crypto technology to just extend to a whole lot more uh, applications from money, which everyone's familiar with, uh, to uh, NFT projects uh, like Board Apes or CryptoPunks. You know, I was listening to your podcast. You guys got a great pod. I think you're on 117 episodes now and growing. You guys do a deep dive. So if people watching, check out the Unstoppable podcast. But in the last podcast, Matt, you mentioned, you know, some of the older generations like me, I grew up with IP addresses. And before the web, they called it information superhighway. It wasn't even called the web yet. Um, but IP was, was generated by the United States Department of Commerce and R&D. That became the internet, the internet became the web. Back then it was just get some web pages up and find what you're looking for, right? Very analog compared to what's now today. Now you mentioned gaming, you mentioned uh, how people are changing. Can you talk about your view of this cultural shift? And we've been talking about the cube for many, many years now, but it's actually happening now where the expectation of the audience and the users and the people consuming and communicating and, and bonding in groups, whether it's gaming or communities are expecting new behaviors, new applications, and it's a forcing function. This shift is happening now. What's your reaction to that? What's your explanation? Yeah, well, I think uh, it just goes back to the shift of people's where are they spending their time? And if you look today, most people spend 50% plus of their time uh, in front of a screen. And that's just a tremendous amount of effort. But if you look at how much, how much of their assets are digital, it's like less than 1% of their portfolio would be some sort of digital asset uh, compared to you know literally 50% of every day sitting in front of a screen. And uh, simultaneously what's happening is these new technologies emerging around uh, cryptocurrencies, blockchain systems, uh, ways for you to track digital ownership of things and then kind of bring that in to uh, your different applications. So one of the big things that's happening with Web3 is this uh, concept of data portability, meaning that I can own something on one application and then I could potentially take that with me to several other applications across the internet. And so this is like the emerging digital property rights that are happening right now as we transition from a model in Web2 where you're on a hosted service like Facebook, it's a walled garden, they own and control everything you are the product, you know, they're mining you for data and they're just selling ads, right? To, to a system where uh, it's much more open, you can go into these worlds and experiences, you can take things with you uh, and you can you can leave with them. And most people are doing this with cryptocurrency. Maybe you earn an in-game currency, you can leave and take that to a different game and you can spend it somewhere else. Uh, so the user is now enabled to bring their data to the party. Whereas before now, uh, you couldn't really do that. And that data includes their money or that includes their digital items. And so I think that's the big shift that we're seeing. And that changes uh, a lot uh, in how applications uh, serve up to users. It's going to change their user experiences, for instance. I think the, flip, the script has flipped and you're right on. I agree with you. I think you guys are smart to see it. And I think everyone who's on this wave will see it. Let's get into that because this is happening. People are saying I'm done with being mined and being manipulated by the big Facebooks and the LinkedIn's of the world who were using the user. Now the contract was a free product and you gave up your data, but then it got too far. Now people want to be in charge of their data. They want to broker their data. They want to collect their digital exhaust, maybe collect some things in a game or maybe do some commerce in an application or a marketplace. So these are the new use cases. How does the digital identity architecture work with Unstoppable? How are you guys enabling that? Can you take us through the vision 
of where you guys came on this because it's unique. You had an NFT and kind of the domain name concept coming together. Can you explain? Yeah, so uh, we think we approach the problem for if we're going to rebuild the way that people interact online, uh, what are kind of the first primitives that they're going to need in order to make that possible? And we thought that one of the things that you have on every network, like when you log on Twitter, you have a Twitter handle. When you log on uh, you know, Instagram, you have an Instagram handle. It's your name, right? You have that name that's, that's on those applications. And right now what happens is if users get kicked off the platform, they lose 100% of their followers, right? And, there's, and they also, in some cases, they can't even directly contact their followers on some of these platforms. So there's no way for them to retain this social network. So you have all these influencers who are today's small businesses who build up these large, you know, profitable small businesses online, uh, you know, being key opinion leaders to their demographic. Uh, and then they could be deplatformed or they're unable to take this data and move to another platform. If that platform raises their fees, you've seen several platforms increase their take rates. You have 10, 20, 30, 40%, and they're getting locked in and they're getting squeezed, right? Uh, so we just said, you know what? The first thing you're going to want to own <laughs> that is going to be your piece of digital property is going to be your name across these applications. And if you look at every computing network in the history of computing networks, they end up with a naming system. And when we looked back at DNS, you know, which came out in the 90s, uh, it was just a way for people to find these web pages much easier, you know, instead of mapping these IP addresses. Uh, and then we said to ourselves, you know, uh, what's going to happen in the future is just like everyone has an email address that they use in their web to world in order to uh, identify themselves as they log into all these applications. They're going to have an NFT domain in the Web3 world in order to uh, authenticate and, and uh, bring their data with them across these applications. So we saw a direct correlation there between DNS and what we're doing with NFT domain name systems. Um, and the bigger breakthrough here is that NFT domain systems are these NFT assets that live on a blockchain. They are owned by users. They're built on these open systems so that multiple applications could read data off of them. And that makes them portable. So we were looking for an infrastructure play, like a picks and shovels play for the emerging Web3 metaverse. Uh, and we thought that names were just something that if we wanted a future to happen where all 3.5 billion people you know, <laughs> with cell phones are sending crypto and digital assets back and forth, they're going to need to have a name to make this a lot easier instead of you know these long IP addresses or hex addresses in the case of crypto. Yeah, and also people have multiple wallets too. It's not like there's all kinds of wallet uh, variations, name verification. We see link trees everywhere. You know, that's essentially just an app. I mean, it doesn't really do anything. I mean, so you're seeing people kind of trying to figure it out. I mean, I got a GitHub handle, I got a LinkedIn handle. I mean, what do you do with it? Yeah, and, and then specific to crypto, there was a very hair on fire use case for people who buy their first Bitcoin. And uh, for those in the audience who haven't done this yet, when you go in and you go into an app and you buy your first Bitcoin or Ethereum or whatever cryptocurrency, and then the first time you try to send it, there's this, there's this field where you want to send it. And it's this very long hex address and it looks like an IP address from the 1980s, right? And it's, and it's, it's like a bank number and no one's going to use that to send money back and forth to each other. And so just like domain names in the DNS system replace IP addresses, NFT domains uh, on blockchain systems replace hex addresses for sending and receiving you know, cryptocurrency, Bitcoin, Ethereum, whatever. And that's its first use case is it really plugs in there. So when you want to send money to someone, you can just, instead of sending money to a large hex address that you have to copy and paste, you could have an error, you could send it to the wrong place. It's pretty scary. You could send it to you know, John Furrier. Uh, NFT. And uh, so we thought that you're just not going to get global adoption without better UX. Same thing, it worked with the dot com domains. And this is the same thing for uh, Bitcoin and other crypto. It's interesting. If you look at the Web 2 or trend 1 to 2, Web 1 went to 2, it was all about use, or ease of use, right? And making things simpler. Clutter, you know, more pages, can't find things. That was search. That was Google. Since then, has there actually been an advancement? Facebook mm. certainly is not an advancement. They're hoarding all the data. So I think we're broken between that step of, you know, a free search to all the resources in the world to, which by the way, they're mining a lot of data too, with the toolbar and Chrome. But now where's that web three crossover? So take us through your vision on digital identity on web two, Google searching, Facebook's broken, democracy's broken, users aren't in charge to web three. Got it. Well, we can start at web one. So the way that I think about it is if you go to web one, it was very simple, uh, just text web pages. So it was just a way for someone to like put up a billboard and here's a piece of information and here's some things that you could read about it, right? Uh, and then what happened with web two was you started having applications being built 
that had you know backend infrastructure to provide services. So if you think about Web two, these are all you know these are uh, websites or web portals that have services attached to them, whether that's a social network service or a search engine or whatever. And then as, as we move to Web three, the new thing that's happening here is the user is coming onto that experience and they're able to connect in their their wallet or their Web three identity uh, to that app, and they can bring their data to the party. So it's kind of like Web one, you just have a you know static web page. Web two, you have a static web page with a service like a server back here. And and then Web3, the user can come in and bring their database with them uh, in order to have much better app experiences. So how does that change things? Well, for one, that means that the, you want data to be portable across apps. So we touched on gaming earlier. And maybe if I have an in-game item for, for one uh, game that I'm playing for a certain company, I can take it across two or three different games. Uh, it also impacts money. Money is just digital information. So now I can connect to a bunch of different apps and I can just use cryptocurrency to make those payments uh, across those things instead of having to use um, a credit card. Uh, but then another thing that happens is I can bring you know, an unlimited amount of additional information about myself when I plug in my wallet. Uh, and as an example, when I plug into Google search, for instance, uh, they could take a look at my wallet that I've connected and they could pull information about me that I enabled uh, that I share with them. And this means that I'm going to get a much more personalized experience on these websites. And I'm also going to have much more control over my data. There's a lot of people out there right now who are worried about data privacy, especially in places like Europe. And one of the ways to solve that is simply to not store the data and instead have the user bring it with them. You know, I've always thought about this and I always debated it with Dave Vellante, my co-host. Does top-down governance privacy laws outweigh the organic bottoms up innovation? So what you're getting at here is, Hey, if you can actually have that solved <laughs> before it even starts, it was almost as if those services were built for the problem of web two. Yes. Not three. Right. What's your reaction to that? I think that is uh, right on the money. And uh, if you look at it as a security, like if I put my security researcher hat on, I think the biggest problem uh, we have with security and privacy on the web today is that we have these large organizations that are collecting so much data on us and they just become these honeypots. And there have been huge uh, breaches, like Equifax you know, a few years back is a big one. And just all your credit card data got leaked, right? And all your uh, credit information got leaked. And we just have this model where these big companies silo your data, they create a giant database, which is worth hundreds of millions of dollars, if not billions to be attacked. And then someone eventually is going to hack that in order to pull that information. Well, if instead, and you can look at this at Web3, so for those in the audience who have used a, a Web3 application, one of these dApps, um, you know, to trade cryptocurrencies or something, yeah. you'll know that when you go there, you actually connect your wallet. So when you're working with these web, you connect, you, you know, you bring your information with you and you connect it. That means that the app has none of that stored, right? So these apps that people are using for crypto trading cryptocurrency on dApps or whatever, they have no stored information. So if someone hacks one of these DeFi exchanges, for instance, uh, there's nothing to steal. And, and that's because the only time the information is being accessed is when the user is actively using the site. And so as, a, as someone who cares about security and privacy, I go, wow, that's a much better data model. And that gives so much more control to the user because the user just permissions access to the data only during the time period in which they're interacting with the application. Um, and so I think you're right. And like, we are very excited to be building these tools, right? Because I see like, if you look at Europe, they basically passed GDPR and then all the companies are going, we can't comply with that. And they keep postponing it or like changing it a little bit and trying to make it easier to comply with. Uh, but honestly, we just need to switch the data model so the companies aren't even taking the data in, and then they're going to be in a much better spot. The GDPR is again, a nightmare. I think it's the wrong approach. I always said it was screwed up because most companies don't even know where, where stuff is stored. Never mind how they delete someone's entry in a database. They don't even know what they're collecting. So at some level, it becomes so complicated. So right on the money there, good, good call out there. Question for you is this then. Okay, so do you decouple the wallet from the ID or are they together? Uh, and is it going to be a universal wallet? Do you guys see yourselves as universal domains? Take me through the thinking around how you're looking at the wallet and the actual identity of the user, which obviously is yeah. super important on the identity side. Wallet, is that just universal or is that going to be coming together? Well, I think, so the way that we kind of think about it is that wallets are where people um, have their financial uh, interactions online, right? And then identity is much more about, it's kind of like being your passport. So it's like your driver's license for the internet. So these are two kind of separate products we see longer term uh, and they actually work together. So, you know, like if you have a domain name, it actually is easier to make deposits into your wallet because it's easier to remember to send money to, you know, matthewpool.crypto. And, and that way it's easier for me to receive payments or whatever. And then inside my wallet, I'm going to be doing DeFi trades or whatever. And that doesn't really have an interaction uh, with names necessarily in order to do those transactions. But then if I want to, uh, 
uh, you know, sign into a website or something, I could connect that with my NFT domain. And I do think that these two things are kind of separate. I think there's, we're going to still early. So figuring out exactly how the industry is going to shake out over like a five to 10 year time horizon, it may be a little bit more difficult. And we could see some other emerging, uh, what you would consider like cornerstones of the crypto ecosystem. But I do think identity and reputation is one of those. Uh, and I also think that your financial applications in DeFi are going to be another. So those are the two areas where I see it. Um, and just to you know, a note on this, when you have a wallet, it usually has multiple cryptocurrency addresses. So you're going to have like 50 cryptocurrency addresses in a wallet. Uh, you're going to want to have one domain name that links back to all those because you're just not going to remember those 50 different addresses. So that's how I think that they collaborate. We collaborate with several large wallets as well, uh, like blockchain.com uh, and, yeah, you know, another 30 plus of these uh, to make it easier for sending out and receiving cryptocurrency. So the wallet basically is a D app, the way you look at it. You integrate it yeah. in whatever you want, just integrate it in. How do I log into decentralized applications with my NFT domain name? Because this becomes, okay, I, I got to love the idea, love my identity, I'm an, I own NFT. I mean, hell, this video is going to be an NFT soon when we get on board with the program here. Uh, but how do I log into my app? I'm going to have a D app and I got my domain name. Do, do I have to submit? Is there benchmarking? Is there approval process? Is there APIs and uh, SDK kind of thinking around it? How are you thinking about dealing with the apps? Yeah, so all of the above, and what we're trying to what we're trying to do here is build like an SSO solution, uh, but that it's consumer based. So uh, what we've done is adapted some SSO protocols that other people have used, the standard ones, uh, in order to connect that back to an NFT domain in this case, and that way you get the best of both worlds. So you can use these authorization protocols for data permissioning that are you know, standard web two APIs, uh, but then the permissioning system is actually based on the user controlled NFT. So they're signing in that with their private public key pair in order to make those updates. Um, so that, that allows you to connect into both of these systems. Uh, we think that that's how technology typically impacts the world is it's not like you have something that just replaces something overnight. You have an integration of these technologies over time. Uh, and we really see these Web3 components and NFT domains integrating nicely into regular apps. So as an example, in the future, when you log in, right now you see Google Auth, Facebook Auth, or you type in an email address, you can see NFT, you know, unstoppable domains or NFT uh, authorization. And you can SSO in with that to that website. When you go to a website, like an e-commerce website, you could share information about yourself because you've connected your wallet now. So you could say, yes, I am a unique individual. I do live in New York uh, and I just bought a new house, right? And then when you, permission all that information about yourself to that application you can serve up a new user experience for you. Um, and we think it's going to be very interesting for doing rewards and discounts um, online for uh, e-commerce specifically uh, in the future, because that, that opens up a whole new market because they can ask you questions about yourself and you can deliver that information directly to the app. I really think that the gaming market has totally uh, nailed the future use case, which is in-game currency, in-game engagement, in-game data, and now bringing that to kind of a horizontally scalable like surface area is, is huge, right? So, you know, I think you're, that's a huge success on the concept. The question I have to ask you is, um, you getting any uh, pushback from ICANN, the International Corporation of Name and Numbers, they got dot everything now, dot club, because of clubhouse, they got dot, you know, party, dot live. I mean, so the real domain name people are over here, web two, you guys are coming out with the web three where does that connect for people who are not following along the Web3 trend? How do they, how do you rationalize the, the domain angle here? Yeah. Well, uh, so I would say that NFT domains are what domains on DNS uh, were always meant to be 30 plus years ago. And they just didn't have blockchain systems back in the 90s when they were building these things. So there's no way to make them for individuals. So what happened was, was for DNS, it actually ended up being for business. So if you look at DNS names, there's about 350 million registrations. They're basically all small business. And it's like, you know, 20 to 50 million small businesses uh, who uh, own the majority of these uh, uh, these .com or these regular DNS domain names, and that's their focus. NFT domains, because all of a sudden you have the uh, the wallet, you have them in your wallet, in your crypto wallet. They're actually for individuals. So that market, instead of being for small businesses, is actually end users. So instead of being for you know 20 to 50 million small businesses, we're talking about being useful for three to four billion people who have an internet connection. Uh, and so we actually think that the market size for NFT domains is somewhere 50 to 100x the market size for traditional domain names. And then the use cases are going to be much more for uh, individuals on a day-to-day -day basis. So it's like 
people are going to want you to use them for receiving cryptocurrency or receiving dollars or payments or USDC coin, or they're going to want to use them as identifiers on social networks, or they're going to want to use them for SSO. Uh, and they're not going to want to use them as much for things like websites, which is what Web2 is. And if I'm being perfectly honest, if I'm looking out 10 years from now, I think that these traditional domain name systems are going to want to work with and adopt this new NFT technology because they're going to want to have these features for the domain name. So like in short, I think NFT domain names are domain names with superpowers. This is the next generation of uh, naming systems and naming systems were always meant to be identity networks. Yeah, they hit a they hit a glass ceiling. I mean, they just can't, they're not built for that, right? So, I mean, and, and having people having their own names is essentially what decentralization is all about because what is a company? It's a collection of humans that aren't working in one place, they're decentralized. So then you decentralize the identity and everything's been changed. So completely love it. I think you guys are onto something really huge here. Um, you pretty much laid out what's next for Web3, but you guys are in this state of, of growth. You're seeing people signing up for names. That's great. What are the, what are the um, best practices? What are the steps are people taking? What's the common uh, use case for folks who are putting this to work right now for you guys? Why do you see, what's the progression? Yeah, so the, the thing that we want to solve for people most immediately is uh, we want to make it easier for sending and receiving crypto payments. And I and I know that sounds like a niche market, but there's over 200 million people right now who have some form of cryptocurrency, right? And 99.9% .9 of them are still sending crypto using these really long hex addresses. And that market is growing at 60 to 100% year over year. So. Uh, first, we need to get crypto into everybody's pocket, and that's going to happen over the next three to five years, let's call it. If it doubles every year for the next five years, we'll be there. Uh, and then we want to make it easier for all those people to send crypto back and forth. And I and I will admit, I'm a big fan of these uh, stable coins and these like, you know, I would say utility focused uh, tokens that are coming out just to make it easier for, you know, transferring money from here to Turkey and back or whatever. Uh, and that's the really the first step for NFT domain names. But what happens is when you have an NFT domain and that's what you're using to receive payments, um, and then you realize, oh, I can also use this to log into my favorite apps, it starts building that identity piece. And so we're also building products and services to uh, make it more like your identity. And we think that's going to build up over time. So instead of like doing an identity network top down, where you're like a government or a corporation, you say, oh, you have to have an ID, here's your password, you have to have it. We're going to do it bottoms up. We're going to give everyone on the planet an NFT domain name. It's going to give them some utility to make it easier to send and receive cryptocurrency. And we're going to say, hey, do you want to verify your Twitter profile? Yes. Okay, great. You attach that back. Hey, you want to verify your Reddit? Yes. Instagram? Yes. TikTok? Yes. You want to verify your driver's license? Okay, yeah, we can attach that back. Uh, and then what happens is you end up building up organically um, digital identifiers for people using these blockchain uh, naming systems. And once they have that, they're going to just, they're going to be able to share that information uh, and that's going to lead to better experiences online for uh, both commerce, but also just better user experiences in general. You know, every company when they web came along, first of all, everyone poo pooed the web once. Oh, it's terrible, a bad idea. Oh, it's so unreliable, it's so slow, hard to find things. Web two, everyone bought a domain name for their company. But then as they added web pages, these permalinks became so long, the, the web page address, fully qualified, you know, permalink string, they bought keywords. And then on, that's another layer on top. So you started to see that evolution in the web. Now it's kind of hit its ceiling. Here, everyone gets their NFT. They, they start doing more things. Then it becomes much more of a use case where it's more usable, not just for one thing. Um, so we saw that movie before. So it's like a permalink, permanent. Yeah. Yes, it, I mean, it, if we're lucky, it will be a decentralized bottoms up global identity uh, that appreciates user privacy and allows people to opt in. And that's what we want to build. And the gas prices thing that's always come out, it's always an objection here that, I mean, blockchain's perfect for this because it's immutable, it's written on the chain, all good, totally secure. Yep. What about the efficiency? How do you see that evolving real quick? Well, so a couple comments on efficiency. Uh, first of all, we picked domains as a first product to market because you know, as you need to take a look and see if the technology is capable of handling what you're trying to do. Uh, and for domain names, you're not updating that every day, right? So like if you look at traditional domain names, you only update it a couple times per year. So, so the usage for that to set this up and configure it, you know, most people set it up and configure it and then they only have a few changes per year. So first of all, the overall, it's not like a game. Right? Not an you, IO problem. Right, right, right. So, so that, that part's good. So we picked a good place to start for going to market. And then the second piece is like, you're really just asking, are computer systems going to get more efficient over time? And if, you know, the history of that has always been yes. Uh, and if, you know, I remember the nineties, I had a, a modem and it was, you know, whatever, 14 kilobits, and then it was 28 and then 56 and then 100. And now I have hundred megabits up and down. Uh, and I look at blockchain systems and they, 
I don't know if anyone has a law for this yet, but throughput of blockchains is going up over time. And you know, there's there's going to be continued improvements over this over the next decade. We need them. We're going to use all of it. Uh, and you just need to make sure you're planning a business that makes sense for the current environment. Just as an example, if you had tried to launch Netflix for online streaming in 1990, you would have had a bad time because no one had bandwidth. So yeah, some applications are going to be, wait to be a little bit later on in the cycle, but I actually think identity is perfectly fine to go ahead and get off the ground now. Yeah, the motivated parties for innovations here. I mean, a point cast failed miserably. That was like the, they tried to stream video over T1 lines, but back in the day is nothing. So again, we've seen those speeds double, triple on homes right now. Matt, congratulations, great stuff. Final, you know, TikTok moment here. How would you summarize short in a short clip, the difference between digital identity in web two and web three? Uh, in, in web two, you don't get to own your own online presence. And in web three, you do get to own it. So I think if you were going to simplify it, really web three is about ownership. Uh, and we're excited to give everyone on the planet a chance to own their name and choose when and where and how they want to share information about themselves. So now users are in charge. Exactly, <laughs> you got it. They're not the product anymore. If you're going to be the product, you might as well monetize the product and that's the data. <laughs> um, real quick thoughts just to close out, the role of data in all this, your view. We haven't enabled users to own their data online since the beginning of the internet, and we're now starting to do that. It's going to have profound changes for how every application uh, on the planet interacts with their users. Awesome stuff. Matt, take a minute to give a plug for the company. How many employees you got? What are you guys looking for, for hiring, um, fundraising? Give a quick, uh, quick commercial for what's going on at Unstoppable Domains. Yeah, so if you haven't already, check us out at unstoppabledomains.com. We're also on Twitter at Unstoppable Web, and we have a wonderful podcast as well that uh, you should check out if you haven't already. And uh, we are just crossed 100 people. We've, we're growing you know, three to five, 100% year over year. Uh, we're basically hiring every position across the company right now. So if you're interested in getting into Web3, even if you're coming from a traditional Web2 background, please reach out. Uh, we love teaching people about this new world and uh, how you can be a part of it. And you're a virtual company, do you have a little headquarters or is it all virtual? What's the situation there? Yeah, I, I actually just assumed we are 100% remote and asynchronous and, and we're currently in five countries across the planet, uh, in, mostly concentrated in the US and EU areas. I heard a rumor too, maybe you can confirm or admit or deny this rumor. I heard a rumor that you have mandatory vacation policy. Uh, this is true, uh, and that's because we are a team of people who like to get things done, uh, and but we also know that recovery is an important part of any organization. So if you push too hard, uh, you know, we want to remind people we're on a marathon, right? This is not a sprint. Uh, and so we want people to be with us long-term. Uh, we do think that this is a 10-year move. And so, yeah, we do force people, to, we'll, we'll unplug you at the end of the year. If you that's have what I was going to ask you. So what's the consequence if I don't take vacation? Yeah, we literally unplug you. <laughs> you, you. You won't be able to get you won't be able to get into Slack, right? And that's uh, that's how we regulate. Well, when people start having their avatars be their bot, and you don't even know what you're unplugging at some point, that's where you guys come in with the NFT, saying that that's not the real person, it's not the real human. Uh, yeah, exactly. We'll be able to check. NFTs, great innovation, great use case. Matt, congratulations. Thanks for coming on and, and sharing the story to kick off this showcase with the Cube. Thanks for um, sharing all that great insight. Appreciate it. Uh, John had a wonderful time. All right, this is theCUBE, Unstoppable Domains showcasing. We got great, 10 great pieces of content we're dropping all today. Check them out, stay with us for more coverage. I'm John Furrier with theCUBE, thanks for watching.